How you doing? I'm Matt with 731woodworks.com. Today, I'm going to show you how to build this fantastic, amazing DIY coffee bar. It's not that difficult and you can do it. Miss 731 designed this coffee bar to fit our space. I love how she designed this. This could be used as a buffet in your dining room. This could be used as laundry storage. It has so many functions that you can use. It's such a functional piece. If you're interested in building one just like this, I have build plans available linked in the description below. Let me show you how we did it. All right, so now we're gonna start by cutting out our plywood to the length that we want or to the width that we want. 14 and a quarter inch is what I'm ripping this, and I'm gonna take it to the table saw and rip that other quarter inch off, so I'm making 14 inch strips. First thing I'm gonna do is cut my sides and my bottom shelf, and then from there I'm gonna cut some one and a half inch strips for my top two rails to tie everything together so that it's not flopping. And then after that, we'll start installing those shelves. First thing we're gonna do is I'm using a Craig Rip Cut that attaches to any circular saw. I had someone say that I say link in the description too much. So all the tools and supplies will be linked in the description below along with build plans of this project. I'm gonna try not to say link in the description after this point. So you won't hear link in the description too much because I say link in the description too much. 14 and a quarter inch rip. I've got them, uh, this plywood clamped on the edge so that it doesn't shift and move. It's a very good idea when you're using a Craig rip cut. The main thing you wanna do with a Craig rip cut is to hold that thing on the side all the way down, all the way through the cut, because it has a tendency to walk at the end of that cut if you don't hold it tight. I've got my Pegasus work tables over here on the left. It's gonna catch that drop so that it doesn't fall. The last thing you wanna do is get down close to the end and that thing start falling and it'll break the plywood. So make sure you support that cut piece. A lot of people put down a piece of foam, catch that drop or to cut on top of that foam. If you don't have a table saw, you can build this project with a Craig Rip Cut and some one by twos instead of ripping down the face frame like I'm gonna do. So it is possible without a table saw, but a table saw will make your life a lot easier. Let's cut. Yeah, I remember a little bit ago, I told you to hold that rip cut tight so it doesn't walk on you. Well, I didn't listen to myself and now I gotta straighten this edge out because it walked and I need these edges to be straight. So I'm just, I've got a Swanson straight edge here. I've got it clamped on both ends. I'm just gonna run my saw down there and get another straight edge to reference off of so that I can continue to make it straight cuts. I'm a dummy. Man, I think my blade's dull. I think that live edge sign got it. Come on. Man, this blade is awful. That ain't gonna work. Whew, I'm making a mess. The struggle is real here. Well, if you saw the live edge sign we made a couple of weeks ago, you saw where I was trying to cross cut that white oak and the blade was already a little dull, but man, that white oak ate this blade up. And so now I'm trying to cut plywood with it and it is not going well. This thing is walking and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Gotta go get a new blade. Then I'm gonna make a straight cut and then I'm gonna get started again. Keep your blades fresh. Don't be like me. That thing is bad for, whoo, come on. That old circular saw blade is hat. In all fairness, it's probably about two years old. New blade, new blade. Now man, am cut some plywood street. Oh my goodness, what a difference a new blade makes. Man, I'm cheap. Should have bought that a long time ago. Now I got a straight cut on that plywood. Now I can start making some cuts. Let's do it. So we want the height of the console or the coffee bar to be 36 inches. We get that inch and a half pine top. So we're gonna cut the sides 34 and a half inches. Let's do it. And a good way to make sure that both pieces are exactly the same, you'll flush up this right side or this, the one end and just move it back in place until that blade just touches the thing and then you just make your cut. That way they're both exact same. Two sides. Pocket hole time. All right, all right, all right. Bottom shelf, two sides, and then we got two stringers for the top. Went ahead and drilled four pocket holes on the bottom shelf. 
I know what you're thinking. That dude is awesome because he's using pocket holes. And you're right. If you don't like pocket holes, man, I'm going to tell you, this channel may not be for you. I use a lot of them. They're easy. They're approachable. That's why I keep using them. The majority of people watching this channel are beginner woodworkers. They want to make awesome projects with basic tools. This is how you do it. No need to overcomplicate things for something that's going to hold coffee cups, dishes, some very lightweight items. If this was a heavy duty shelf, we're trying to make it as heavy duty as possible. We'll cut some dados in here. I'm not going to do that. Fast, easy, beginner woodworking projects. Tape measure, pencil. <laughs> I love buildings though, don't you? God, this is awesome. Up from the bottom, almost like up on the rooftop. Click, click, click. Up from the bottom, we're going to measure three and a half inches. And the reason we're doing that is because my farmhouse TV stand, we're making this to match it. We want a matching set. It's got a three and a half inch trim piece across the front and down the sides. It's also happened to be the same size as a one by four. One by four. But that is a one by four. If you don't want to rip down one by sixes like I'm going to do, I'm going to rip them down to three and a half inches so they're nice and good and square. But you can also use a one by four to put on the front and down the sides. That'll work for you if you don't have a means to rip things. What I'm going to do is measure up from the bottom three and a half inches. And I'm going to make a mark. I'm going to do that on both ends. And then we're going to attach this with pocket holes. I'm going to take a, a what do you call it, thing? A clamp. I'm going to take a clamp, hold it together, and then we'll put the top stringers in uh, the same way. It's three and a half inches from the bottom, then we're going to attach this bottom. So from the, I say so a lot. No more fillers. More fillers. He's okay. Okay, so <laughs> from the bottom of the side panel up to the top of this bottom shelf is three and a half inches. I've made a mark. We're going to put some glue on there, then I'm going to clamp it down before I put the pocket hole screws in so that it's all wampa jaw. That way it doesn't get all wampa jaw when you're putting it together. So you wanna make sure the front of this is flush right here. And then I'm gonna take this 60 inch Harbor Freight. Man, these things are cheap and they're great for just stuff just like this. Lay it right on top. You'll line up that line inside there and then we'll pocket hole. Just wanna make sure you keep that three and a half inch distance from the bottom up to the top of that shelf. That way everything stays nice and square. So I just snug that side up. Then I want to make sure this side is where it needs to be. Once I get that on there, I'm going to tighten it up just a little more. I'm going to take one pocket hole screw and put in this top edge because this front face is flat. And now this side here, that secures that. And then I can move down here and make sure everything is like I want it before I tie it all together. It's actually a really simple build. The finished product will look a whole lot more complicated than it actually is. These are inch and a quarter pocket hole screws. Do the same thing on this other end. I've already glued it, so make sure that line is lined up and this front side is flush. I'm just gonna spin it around. If I had a little more mess, that'd be awesome. Now the tops will be really flimsy here because and there's nothing holding them up there to be stable. Normally I would have just walked around on the other side and done this camera angles. See how they're really flimsy? That's okay. We're fixing to fix that. That's what these are for. These will be covered up by trim also or the back, which is a quarter inch plywood. Uh, the main thing here is I suggest you take these pocket holes and go that way. If you come this way, it's going to bust into that end. You don't want that. We're going to glue both ends. Handy dandy glue spreader there. Put a little more on this end. Put the extra under there for later. Now what I actually did was snug this up just a little bit. That way it brings a little pressure in and then this doesn't slip and slide and flop on you. Just want to make sure the top is flush. This outside edge is flush. You know what? I got something for that. This is a Craig thingamajig clamp. It's got that little thingamajig. It goes in the pocket hole. That'll do. Now I cut these an inch and a half because my trim piece is going to be two inches. I'm not sure if I told you that. So now we're doing the exact same thing on the other side, back side, front side, whichever side this winds up being. Again, snug this clamp up so that it gives this a little pressure so that you can, you don't have to just sit there and hold it the whole time. We're going to put a little glue again. My pencil keeps leaving. So I just cut these. They're actually about two and seven eighths of an inch uh, strips. They should match whatever this is. So you measure from the bottom of your shelf to the bottom of your legs or the sides. That's what thickness this will be. So make sure you double check that. So I just divided this equally so that it gets a nice support all the way across. And then this is 17 and 3 sixteenths of an inch from the inside of the leg to the inside of your brace on both sides, 17 and 3 16 and then the inside to inside here. 
is also 17 and 3 16 now if these aren't perfect it doesn't really matter because they're going to be hidden underneath i just try to give it equal support so just get it close i marked a line there just so that i keep track of where this goes this is glue uh, and you'll notice i put two pocket hole screws that's going to screw up into there and then there's two that's going to screw into the face of the or to the back side of this trim piece so that that gives it something to secure to you just want to make sure this is flush right here this still is the same width as the end or the end pieces the shelves all the stuff should be cut the exact same width which is 14 inches so what i want to do is take this piece and cut it to fit inside here which should be 31 and just barely over an eighth, between an eighth and three sixteenths. And then I'm gonna notch around these braces to give, to tie into these braces that'll give everything nice structure. So they'll just have a little notch right here, cut out for this piece. And I'm gonna cut it the length first. So at the top, we know that we want this thing to notch around a inch and a half wide by three quarter inch wide, or whatever your plywood actually is. So I'm just gonna hold that right there. Just mark around it. That gives us our notch. Do that on both sides. So that is the Craig R3. It's the first pocket hole jig that I ever had. And it's perfect for situations like this. I want to take and drill a pocket hole so that I can attach to those runners. And this is a great way to do that because this actually won't go into the K5 now. I'm going to do that on both sides. So now I've got those pocket hole screws or pocket holes in there. I'll put some glue down there, put some glue up here as well. That way I can pocket hole screw that into the top. Underneath, I'm going to take and brad nail this in from underneath. Uh, that glue and brad nail will be more than enough to hold this in place. Once that glue is bonded, it ain't moving. Same thing here is you want to make sure that the front is flush and the top is flush. You can do that. You good. I went ahead and cut the shelves out. They're just 14 inches wide <clears throat> on the sides. On these two are, are just 14 inches wide. You'll remember we cut this 14 inches, so it should just be a 14 inch square. Just double check. So when you put it in there, the main thing, you don't want this pushing out and bowing or either side to flex, but you want a good snug fit. So I'm gonna drill pocket holes, shark, shark, shocker. Pocket holes, probably three on each side. Put them in there. We want to split the difference and make it right in the middle. And to do that, I just measure down two inches and then measure it up from there to that two inch mark. <clears throat> measured up to that two inch mark, 29 and eight, divided that in half, made a mark, and then three eighths inch down from there because this plywood is about three quarters of an inch. That puts the bottom of the shelf from the top of the bottom shelf to the bottom of this middle shelf should be 14 and 3 16 of an inch. On this one, we're gonna put this in three parts. I did the exact same thing. I just divided it by three, and then I'll tell you the measurements so you can follow along. From the top of this shelf to the bottom of the first shelf, you're looking at nine and five sixteenths of an inch. And then to the bottom of the second shelf, nine and one sixteenth of an inch, 19 and one sixteenth of an inch. You want either want to measure at the bottom or right here at the top so that you get them right, but it should be 23 and nine sixteenths of an inch. After these shelves are in, make sure you measure again that just in case this pushed it in just a little. You don't want it to, but sometimes it'll flex it in just a little bit and you'll wind up having to just trim that piece up. So So we got the basic frame together. Uh, I got everything screwed, glued, at least some sanding to be done. I'm gonna go ahead and put the back on there. And what that quarter inch plywood back is gonna do is 
just make everything rigid, rock solid. It won't rock side to side, anything like that. Just gonna glue and brad nail it on. You saw me rip it, rip it good. I ripped it 34 and 5 eighths, which is the height of our stand. Now I gotta cut it to length, obviously. The reason I go ahead and put it on now, if you go watch the farmhouse TV stand video, I put it on last and it wind up sticking off the back a quarter inch. You can see the edge of it. Not a big deal, most people don't see it, but I don't like it. So this time I'm going to put this on and then we'll bring our trim out and cover that up. Nobody will ever see it. So yesterday the battery died and this quarter inch plywood back you saw me put on, it adds a lot of structural stability to your piece. If you leave that off, it's gonna be rickety and wampa jawed and you don't want that. So you put that on there, that's gonna make everything nice and structurally sound, just glue and brad nails. Just be really careful where you put your brad nails so you don't uh, misfire one. But as you can see, it's really sturdy now. Put that quarter inch plywood strips on. It's, these two pieces are a different color because it come from a different sheet of Luon. Uh, that's the bad thing about that Luon. Sometimes you get some that looks like this. Sometimes you get some that looks like that. It's kind of a hit and miss. So now we're gonna face frame this thing out. We're just gonna take, I got some one by sixes, rip down the bottom piece. So it'll be a three and a half inch strip. And then the rest of it's gonna be two inch strips. You don't know about the middle yet. We're gonna figure that out. So this quarter inch plywood strips, I actually, so the, the, if you'll remember the width of our upright pieces on the edges are 14 inches. I ripped these pieces three and a half inches wide by 14 and a quarter inches long. And the reason I did that, we got this quarter inch backing on there. And so that if you cut them a 14 and a quarter, it'll come out flush with the back. That way, if you're looking at this thing from the side, you're not gonna see that quarter inch plywood sticking out. You do it however you want to, but that's how I did it. If it doesn't work out just perfectly, because you want to make sure that front is flush when you're putting these pieces on. You saw us use a nickel uh, for spacing, which is about an eighth inch, maybe a little less. That gives that, that little gap there. So, But if you want to cut these flush, you can use a flush trim bit on your router and do that. Let's put some face frame on. There's a lot of ways to do face frame. Some people will go ahead and build the whole face frame and then attach it. I'm going to build it in place. And the way I'm going to do that is that the bottom piece is just going to be a three and a half inch strip of Wumba, Wumba material. And we're gonna put the front on first. No, nope. I'm gonna put the sides on first. It's gonna be flush to the front. And then we'll put the uh, front piece on. Yay. Now the top and the edges and all that's gonna be a two inch strip. It's just the bottom is a little wider, gives a little more definition. So this is just the trim pieces. This is just a, you can use a one before. This is three and a half inches wide. I ripped down a, uh, one by six, it's gonna do the same thing as how we put this stuff on is just glue and brad nail it. And these are cut 14 and a quarter, the same size as these. If you take another board and put up here, you can press this one into it and it gets it flush. <clears throat> we'll come back and fill these with some wood filler because we're, we're saying, or we're painting this. If I was staining it, I would just leave them because I haven't, I've yet to find a wood filler that stains the same color as you would. All right, Nongi? So on cutting out these face pieces, I am jointing one edge before I run them through the table saw. If you don't have a jointer, all you gotta do is go check out my jointing with a table saw trick. I've used it on a bunch of videos prior to this one, or I have a dedicated video just to it. I'll drop it in the description below. But all that does is get that nice square edge. It takes the rounded edge off that factory lumber, and it just gives you a nice smooth square edge. So if you notice, this edge is the jointed edge. This edge is the factory edge. It has a little bit of rounding right there. 
That way when these two pieces come together, which is mainly what I was after, when these two pieces come together, then it's gonna be a nice tight seam. If you don't do that and you have that rounded edge, you're gonna have that gap in there and it's not gonna look all that great. This piece will be, what's up girl, how you doing? So if this piece is two inches and you want this piece to show look the same two inches, then you'll have to rip this piece, piece down to an inch and a quarter because you'll have that three quarter inch piece here that it's buttoned up against. That'll give you a two inch look here and a two inch look here, it'll all look uniform. So right here what I'm talking about, I got this two inch piece cut already to the size. It should be snug, but it shouldn't be so tight that it feels like you have to force it in there. You should be able to move it around a little bit, but it should be snug and all the gaps and stuff should, should look tight. Now, if they're not, you can always, if you're painting this, go back with some wood filler, CA glue, whatever you would like to use to fill those holes up. This is, if I do have any gaps, I'll do that. This is that two inch piece. It should be flush with the bottom. It should be flush with the outside of this piece here. <clears throat> this inch and a quarter strip will go in here like this. We're gonna glue and brad nail all this in. But when everything comes together, this should be a two inch piece looking from the side. This will be a two inch piece looking from the side. So you got three quarters of an inch, you got an inch and a quarter. That makes that a two inch wide. Yeah. I got the boss coming to decide how we want to do this. This is a two inch strip. This is a one inch strip. I'm wondering if we want to go wider here or if she wants that thinner. Here she comes. I need your opinion. Would you marry me? Here forth marry her. So this is a two inch piece to match right. this, this. This is a one inch piece. Do you want that one inch strip for the verticals with two inch strips here and here? Or would you prefer the two inch strip? I like the one inch going vertical. Okay, with two inches here. I don't know what that one inch back problem. Now what you wanna see? I wanna see another two. Do you have a one inch? I think I want one inch vertical and horizontal. Yeah. Yeah. I want that one inch. Well, golly. You sure that's what you want? Mm -hmm. Is that what you really want? Hey, this thing's good. <laughs> this thing, this is spruce, in case I hadn't told you. I just cut these in one inch strips because that's what Miss 731 wanted. One inch on the inside frame, two inch on the outside frame. Of course, the bottom's that three and a half inch strip. Gives a little more definition. I'm gonna putty and paint, or putty and sand all of these holes, uh, these pin holes, nail holes, so that when we paint, everything is uh, nice and smooth and it looks really good. Uh, like one thing I do have to do is cut some slots for my tabletop fasteners. If you haven't seen me do that, uh, go check out the last farmhouse coffee table build. I go into good detail on how to cut those. Basically, you take a router with an eighth inch straight bit, cut those slots with an edge guide, gives you something to mount your tabletop with. So the plan is to sand this, take it outside, get it primed, put the primer coat on, and then build the tabletop while the primer is drying. Kind of two birds, one stone scenario. Oh, I centered these up. I don't know if you saw combination square. I just got it to where it was the center. Looks like uh, about an eighth of an inch, a little less than an eighth on each side. And I would hold it in, uh, make sure this is centered. And also make sure everything was nice and square while I was doing it. That way these seams fit together nicely. This face framing was out of two 10 foot one by sixes. And I had a couple of small pieces left over. If you do your cutting right, it'll work out. If these are gonna be any wider than one inch, then you're gonna need an extra board. So if you wanna make these two inches instead of the one inch, if you like that look better, get three one by sixes. Tabletop fasteners or a Z-clip. Has a hole in one side, this piece goes into the slot we're fixing to cut, this screw goes under from underneath into the tabletop. This allows for wood movement in and out side to side. That way your top don't split. If you pocket hole screw it in there rigidly, it doesn't leave room for it to expand and contract. <laughs> you can't breathe, you gotta breathe. The way I set these, I got an edge guide. I set the depth that the slot's gonna be in like that. And then I take the edge guide. If you don't have an edge, I've heard people use biscuit. 
I've heard some people use biscuit joiners. You can do that. But I just lay this little dude on there and slide this edge guide in until it matches the dip. So I'm gonna be using Starbond medium thick CA glue to fill these little nail holes as well as any gaps. I don't see a whole lot of gaps, but if there is one that has a little gap, I'll fill it with this stuff. You just put it in the little gap, spray this activator on there at 30 seconds. It's dry, it can be sanded, painted. It's not stainable, I don't think. It's dur more durable than the wood putty, so you don't have to worry about this cracking and coming out later. It's really good stuff. I have a video on this. If you wanna go check that out, just 731 Woodwork CA glue, you should be able to find it. If not, you know where to look. I'll put it down there where I'm not supposed to say in the description. So what I did do, 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 what I did do is I got a little nail punch. Any that were not set in, I went back with this little nail punch, like this one sticking out right at the surface. I'm gonna put that little nail punch right on top of it. That drives it on in there, and then that way you can fill that hole. If you don't, and you leave that nail little head shining out when you paint it, that's where your paint's gonna flick off, and you don't want that. So any that you see, uh, go over it with a fine tooth comb, find the nail hole, and set them with a nail punch. Any knot holes you have, you can fill that with that CA glue, any uh, gaps. I went ahead and filled up a bunch of these little seams, even though they're really tight. I wanna go ahead and fill that up as much as possible with that stuff, uh, even on the face or on the top side of these uh, pieces where they come together. You can barely see a little line there. I went ahead and put that in there. We'll sand it smooth. Um, when I'm sanding, I'm gonna take the edge or the sander and just kind of just knock the rough or the sharp edge off of these uh, pieces that way you don't get any splintering and it keeps it'll give that paint something to stick to other than that sharp edge if you just leave it real sharp then that paint may chip there uh, later on down the line so now we sand Looking good. Power Beats Pro. Isolate that sound. You can't even hear yourself sing. Sometimes that's dangerous. So I went back and a couple of places that the CA glue didn't get down in that hole, I did go back and put some putty on there so I cheated. You saw me use that leaf blower and that just blows all the dust off from the sanding and the building and all that. I just wiped this down with a damp rag and then we're fixing to put some primer on it. couple of real quick things before we start painting. You see that line right there? I'm sure on the video it looks like a gap. That's just where I filled it with that CA glue. And then of course you see here where I've sanded off a little bit of that veneer because this and this weren't exactly flat. And now that it is flat, you once that's painted, you won't be able to see that. You can see it down there too. A little bit of that veneer because that was a little higher than this. It is now perfectly flat and even I'm not worried about that. If you were staining it, then you would need to worry about it. On the back side, if you're building this for yourself, you'll see where you've layered in that shiplap right there, the faux shiplap. So we got our one by, we got our shiplap, and then there's a gap where this didn't fit perfectly squared, but it doesn't matter, it's all glued and squared. We'll look at the other end. I got two holes cut because I got an air vent that's gonna be under there blowing air out. I don't wanna cover that vent. On this side, everything fit together nicely, so we got we got our one by, we got our ship lap, and then the back. So you can kind of see what it's supposed to look like on the back. We're fixing to prime this dude. This is premium wall and wood primer from Sherwin Williams. Uh, the manager at Sherwin Williams, uh, Mr. Dale, recommended this to go under that Pro Classic that we're going to use. Uh, so this is what we're fixing to spray. And I'm using my Home Right Finish Max sprayer. 
I've had this thing for about three years. Um, so if you want to go check out the review on that, it's about three years back on the channel. And as you can see, it's got a lot of paint on it. I have used it on tons of projects. And for this type of work, these type of projects, this works great. Now, it's not a $300 Fuji, $400, $500 Fuji sprayer. It's a $100 home right sprayer. So expect those results. But it does a really good job for what, for what you pay for it. We're gonna lay down about two coats of this. I'm gonna put down, uh, obviously, one coat, let it dry, then we'll put down the second coat. I'm gonna pour this in out there so that uh, So I bought two 10 foot two by eights to make the top out of. This is just common yellow pine, number twos, uh, number two grade. I'm really not happy with the boards I picked out. This is all they had at the local store. And oh my goodness, are these things expensive. 30 is almost $40 for two boards. Freaking insane, man. It's just insane. So what I'm gonna do, I went ahead and cut them I know that my tabletop is going to be 57 and a quarter total length overall, which is four foot nine and a quarter. And, uh, be, and that's going to give us a half inch overhang on each end. And then it's going to be 16 inches uh, deep. So that's going to give us a half inch overhang on the front and back. What I'm going to do is I've taken these two by eights and I've already cut them one inch longer than I need. So they're actually 58 and a quarter. That way we can square those ends up once everything's assembled. Joint one side, rip them to size, 16 divided by three, whatever that comes out to be. This is the DeWalt Mobile Pro app, check this out. Got a calculator on it, we can just do, so we just do 16 inches divided by three equals five and five sixteenths of an inch. That's how wide each board needs to be, five and five sixteenths of an inch. So I'm gonna join them and then cut them down that size, five and five sixteenths of an inch each. Joiner first. If you don't have a jointer, you can check out my jointing with a table saw method. I've done it dozens of times. It works pretty good. Got that put together, just pocket holes and glue. It's pretty flat, actually. I was a little concerned that it wasn't gonna be flat enough, but I had to, man, I had to face joint that thing, and I actually forgot all about the fact that I could face joint those boards with that jointer and make them flat because they had a little bow in them, and it worked pretty good. So now I'm gonna cut this to length, uh, 56, what was it? What was it, Nongi? 57 and a quarter is the top length. Uh, I'm just gonna cut about a half inch off each end just so that each end is squared up. And then we're gonna do this, use this 3 8 inch round over bit. It's sticking up just a little bit so that the, it gives a little profile like you see here. It's a really nice looking uh, feature that you can do with the round over bit. This is a white side round over bit. It's really sharp and it's brand new. So it should cut really well, especially on soft pine. Minwax pre-stain conditioner. If you haven't seen my video on this, go check that out. This stuff is magic in a can, especially if you're using it on pines and softwoods like that, spruce. This stuff will make all that blotchiness disappear. It really, really works. I really believe in it. I use it on every single one of my staining projects. It's just that good. And it's only like $12, $15 for a quart. It lasts for quite a long time. Am I even recording? Yep. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this on there. We'll let that set about 30, 45 minutes while I go put some paint on this base. And then when we come back, we're gonna use some gray stain that Miss 731 got. Go get you some of this. Y'all 
y'all want to go share something with your friend, your mama and them, that Wahoota jointer, this is the first tabletop I've made since getting that jointer. Man, that thing is... Check it. Seamless seams. Look, can you even see it? Can you see the seam right there? Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. man and that thing does a fantastic job. It's not... Well, it did an excellent job. I messed up right here because it had a little bit of a, a bow in it. And so I was jointing the edge, jointed the edge, and it was coming out, and then I just stopped for whatever reason. But it'll have a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of a gap right there. We're talking a 64th of an inch. Otherwise, that thing looks fantastic. And we're fixed to put this Verithane sun bleached on there. Once this has been on there, this pre-stain's on there about 30 minutes. So this is Sherwin Williams Pro Classic. The, I get you the paint coat. So if you've watched this channel at all, you know I'm a fan of this Pro, Pro Classic. It's a very durable paint, especially for furniture items and things like that. The name of that paint is Alabaster 7008. It's actually just a touch off of pure white. Pure white is just a shade lighter than this. This should match our cabinets, which is Benjamin Moore Advance. Yeah, Benjamin Moore Advance in Dove White. So it's kind of just a, just a shade off of pure white. Ended up with two coats of that alabaster white from Sherwin Williams at Pro Classic. We also put on before that two coats of that primer. Between each coat, I sanded with a high grit. This is 1500 grit sandpaper and just a sanding block. These are really inexpensive and it makes that paint a lot smoother if you just sand between coats. Is it perfect? No, I don't create perfect things. I'm an imperfect being, as I've said bunches of times. Is it awesome? You dang right it is. Now that Home Right sprayer is not going to leave a perfectly flat finish, like perfectly smooth. It is a hundred dollar sprayer. So I got a little thick right here. I'm going to show you my mistakes. I got a little thick right here. I should have filled that in a little better. I got a couple of nail holes that didn't get fully filled in before I painted. A little gap between the face piece and the shelf. I mean, it's not exactly perfect. A couple of nail holes there I should have filled in a little better. Obviously, I could go back and fill those in, sand them back smooth, touch them up with paint. If this was a customer's build, I would do that. Since it's going in our home, I'm not going to do that because it looks really good. We like it like this. Got a little character about it. One another couple of my mistakes on this build. I tried to put this right in the center, and I was trying to figure on this two inch piece, dropping it down so that this opening was the same as this opening. They're not exactly the same. This one's 14 inches. This one is 14 and a quarter inches. So it's a quarter of an inch off. Where I miscalculated was this one inch strip right here. If I take off the one inch strip up to that three quarters of an inch, this shelf is exactly center. So this one inch strip drop this down one quarter of an inch, it makes it off a quarter of an inch. These two are thrown off by also by this quarter inch piece. And then this top shelf is actually about a quarter inch taller than these two. I don't care about that. This is in the center of these two. This is in the center of these two. 
Nobody's ever gonna know that unless I told you it. So there you go. If you're using the, my build plans, they're gonna be exactly like this. So just remember that. If you want it to be different, you need to raise it up just a little bit. It's not without imperfections, but it is a beautiful piece. I think Miss 731 did a fantastic job coming up with this design. Really like it and it matches our TV stand, which by the way, happens to be right here. And we painted, that's my GoPro. We painted this white alabaster white to match the coffee table. Has the same design on the end as the coffee bar. Look at that. Got that faux ship lap on the end. Looks really good. There's a build video for the TV stand to match if you're interested in that and you can go check that out. You know what time it is, power tip time. So the power tip for this project on these tabletop fasteners, especially when you're using construction grade pine or boards, they usually have a little bit of a warp or a bow or a twist in them. And if you don't have the jointers and planers, you can't get it all out. Even I have a jointer and face jointed all of these boards to the point that I just got tired of running them through there before I got most of the bow out because it was so bowed. So one of the things I do to combat that, and so that the top doesn't have just an awful gap somewhere in it, is I use a lot of these tabletop fasteners and what I cut more slots than I actually need. So I cut them on each corner, I cut them on the ends, I cut them on the inside of this uh, uprights, and then in every section there. So basically anywhere that there's gonna be a gap, I have a way to pull that gap down using the tabletop fastener. Now I'm not just pulling giant gaps, but if it's a little gap, you know, a 16th or an eighth of an inch, that'll actually pull it out of there. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you what, this thing turned out beautiful. When you get finished with your project and you can stand back and look at it and you're like, I built that. I can't believe I made that. You can build this stuff too. It is not that hard. You're, if you don't think you can, you're really overthinking this stuff. <sighs> I'm proud of that piece. Miss 731 did an awesome job designing that. And just wait till you see how she decorates it. We bought some new decorations to go on this thing today. We're fixing to take this in and do that. Man, I'm like well up with pride because I made this. I'm telling you, man, I, I can't quit smiling. This thing looks awesome. <laughs> for the lumber and the paint, we were at about $300 for materials. And then I had the Odie's oil as well as the Verithane sun bleach stain on hand. So you're looking, if I had to buy that as well, close to 350 all in. So if you're gonna price this to sell and you're gonna make a profit, we got two and a half days build in it, you're gonna need to price it upwards of $1,000, $1,200 in that price range to make a good decent profit on it. And I think it's very much worth it. This is a awesome statement piece in the home. Click that box right there. It takes you to the next set of videos. If you click that box, you know you're getting that big old virtual fist bump. Clicking that box and watching that next video is one of the best ways you can support this channel. Also, you can click this box here. It's another one of my favorite videos. If you hadn't subscribed yet, click that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up, share it on your social media. We appreciate you watching.